Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, the first conference on emerging technologies for global food security. So for the people who are just uh, moving in now, if we can uh, see if we can find a seat for you. We've got a pretty much a full house for this conference, which we're very pleased about. Um, and uh, we've got an exceptional program of speakers. Um, just to start, I would like to say we couldn't possibly be here were it not for the generosity of uh, Potash Corporation and the government of Saskatchewan. They are um, really the founding funders of the Global Institute for Food Security, and we really thank them from the bottom of our hearts for making all of this possible. Uh, we have many other sponsors that you will hear about during the meeting. Um, it's been uh, uh, e enormously encouraging just to see the number of uh, organizations, national and international, that have supported uh, this, uh, this conference. My name is uh, Morris Maloney, and I'm the Executive Director and CEO of the Global Institute for Food Security, uh, who are the main sponsor of the conference. We are running this conference uh, in collaboration with our colleagues at AgWest Bio uh, here in Saskatoon, and many people know Wolf Keller, who is the, the CEO of AgWest. Now, the inspiration for this conference began quite a few years ago, to be honest, before I even came to GIFs. Um, and that was a time when I was the director of Rothamsted Research in the UK. Uh, it's uh, um, the oldest continuously functioning agricultural research center in the world. And while I was there, we talked a lot about food security and about our role as research scientists. And it was really on the heels of a major report from the Royal Society, which has become known as the Balkan Report, um, in which Questions associated with the mobilization of discovery science were really raised. And that was, that was to us one of the big questions. How important is discovery research to the developing world? Surely it was far too high tech to be able to mobilize things easily and uh, the cost associated with it would be out of the question for many people in the developing world. But it was through discussions with uh, my colleague, uh, John Pickett, who's here uh, and a speaker uh, uh, at this conference, who explained to me the origin and the implementation of push-pull technology in maize cultivation with uh, Professor Zair Khan, who is also here and will be a speaker at the conference and will talk about this innovation. And push-pull, as you will learn in this conference, is a, a quintessential example of the mobilization of discovery research directly into the field. It's a cutting edge series of discoveries that allowed this to happen, but it's had enormous impact on maize cultivation in East Africa. About the same time, I uh, heard a brilliant talk by Sigrid Hoyer, who's also here. She was at IRI at the time, the International Rice Research Institute now in, in, in Adelaide. She's speaking at this conference. And she talked about uh, developing uh, flooding tolerance rice and the isolation of a gene called a sub-1 gene, which was mobilized in a very short period of time, making a difference to rice farmers in Asia. One or two more examples, TJ Higgins' work. TJ is also here on insect resistance in cowpea uh, in West Africa. It convinced me that there is a clear path for discovery research to move directly into the developing world. And that it is much more a question of mindset, just our orientation towards our research, rather than massive technological complexity or cost. So here we find ourselves uh, this week in sunny Saskatoon. Um, as we pay our taxes in this province, the Ministry of Weather has laid on some very good weather for us, and we're thankful to the province for that. Um, but we have now the opportunity to discuss the science, the challenges, and indeed the obstacles to the implementation of many of the science, uh, scientific discoveries that we will talk about. Our cause is noble. We do want to feed the world. But the path to feed in the world must be paved with thoughtful analysis and open-mindedness. We shall debate some of these ideas uh, in play today um, in a public forum with world experts. 
and it will be moderated by one of our intellectual national treasures, Rex Murphy. And uh, we very much look forward to that debate uh, a little bit later on in the afternoon. However, by Thursday evening, I hope that we'll have learned from each other, we'll have built new alliances and conceived of new plans that will help us meet the challenge of feeding 9.6 billion people by 2050. Welcome to all our international and national visitors. Thank you for the great generosity of our sponsors. And we are very proud to host this conference in Saskatchewan, which is the agri agricultural heartland of Canada. Thank you. And now I'm going to call upon a few folks just to say words of welcome that are very relevant uh, to uh, this city and the, and the theme of the conference. First of all, let me call upon uh, Randy Burton from Potash Corp, uh, who will bring uh, greetings from uh, Potash Corporation and also tell us a little bit about their work in global food security. Randy. Thanks, Morris. Wonderful to be here today. I just want to wish everyone, all the visitors to Saskatoon and Saskatchewan, a warm welcome today. As you know, this is Gordy Howe's birthplace, home to hockey, 100,000 lakes, and 38 million acres of farmland. So we know a little bit about farming, I think. And of course, we're home to potash, which is what I'm here to speak to you about today. Potash Corp, as you may know, is the world's largest fertilizer company, producing the three primary crop nutrients, potash, nitrogen, and phosphate. Aside from being our namesake, potash is the core of our business. We have our corporate headquarters and five world-class potash mines here, which together represent about 20% of global capacity. As I mentioned, we've also got world-scale phosphate and nitrogen operations located in several spots in the U.S. and in Trinidad. But we think of ourselves as more than just a fertilizer producer. We feel we make an important contribution to food security, both here at home and in the developing world. Approximately half of world food production is directly attributable to fertilizers. When you think about that, it's really quite astounding. Without fertilizer, nearly half the world's food couldn't be produced. That's a huge contribution, but we know there's still a lot more to do. According to the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, almost 800 million people go to bed hungry every night. Most of them are in the developing world, but the hungry are with us right here at home as well, and more than we might think. It's an ongoing challenge, but it's only part of the picture. As Morris pointed out, the world's population is growing to more than 9 billion by 2050, so that means in less than 35 years there's going to be another 2 billion mouths to feed. In order to meet the need, we're going to have to increase food production by more than 60 percent from what we do today. And we have to do that while meeting at least three key challenges. We have limited arable land available. We have limited water supplies in many parts of the world. And we have to produce a great amount of new food in an environmentally sustainable way. The way we do that is by addressing the yield gap. That is the difference between what many countries currently produce and what their actual larger potential is. You'll be talking about some of the answers to that question here over the next few days. It's obviously going to include research and development, new technologies, and more productive seeds, among other things. But an important part of the answer will also be the responsible use of fertilizers. In order to increase world food production in a sustainable way, farmers will need to use the right fertilizer at the right rate, at the right time, in the right place. This 4R strategy is a focus within the fertilizer industry and something we talk about a lot. Greater food production and environmental sustainability are not mutually exclusive. The two can and must go hand in hand if we're to meet the challenges ahead. We know that many soils around the world and here in North America are deficient in nutrients, particularly potash. Achieving a better balance of soil nutrients will be an essential part of the solution to the food production problem. We also know that the world is not invested enough in research. In order to feed a growing world, we need more research into improving yields through improved fertilizer nutrient use efficiency. We work through a number of fertilizer industry agencies, as well as with the Global Institute for Food Security, as, as Morris mentioned. As a founding partner of GIFS, we will play a role in the contributions it can make in the years ahead. 
Beyond our role in research and innovation, we also try to raise awareness and make a contribution through our community investment program, both at home and abroad. Internationally, we have partnered with organizations like Free the Children to bring positive food solutions to the forefront in the developing world. Potash Corp is the founding partner of the agriculture and food security pillar within Free the Children's International Development Program. With them, we partner on projects in a number of developing countries, such as China, India, and Africa. These projects are aimed at increasing food security in local communities and training local farmers in a range of improved agricultural techniques. But as I mentioned earlier, hunger and food insecurity are not limited to developing countries. We have those issues right here at home. Between 2008 and 2015, for example, food bank usage in Saskatchewan has risen by more than 50%. They currently serve more than 28,000 people per month. 45% of those clients are children. That's why we also support local food banks and other hunger programs in all the areas where we operate within Saskatchewan, the U.S., and Trinidad. This money goes to food relief, but it also supports at-risk individuals through training programs, career counseling, and other services. As I said at the outset, we see ourselves as more than a crop nourishment company. We also see ourselves as nourishing human potential. I'll wrap up now by showing you a video we shot last year around the International Year of the Soils that was declared by the United Nations. It encapsulates a lot of what I've been talking about here today. Thanks very much. Everyone needs a reason to get out of bed each morning. A real reason. Beyond a paycheck or a mounting to-do list. For those of us in the business of feeding and fueling our growing world, the lucky ones, that reason is all too clear. While you were asleep last night, more than 30,000 people joined the ranks of the human population. Another 170,000 will be with us by the time you lay your head down on the pillow tonight. Yet, the real challenge of our soaring population is not making room for everyone. There is plenty of land for that. Rather, the real challenge is making enough food for everyone. Over the next 30 years alone, we need to produce more food than in the last 10,000 years combined. And there is precious little farmable land left in this world capable of delivering these vital needs. Which means what little farmland we do have needs a lot of care and feeding. Little wonder the United Nations has named 2015 the International Year of Soils. Because soil, without question, is one of the world's most precious natural resources. As the world's largest producer of crop nutrients, Potash Corp has long been committed to keeping soils healthy. Because when soils are healthy, crop yields grow. When soils are healthy, small businesses grow. When soils are healthy, community investment grows. In fact, when soils are healthy, entire economies grow. The way we see it, when Potash Corp nourishes the soil, what we're really nourishing is human potential, which should help everyone rest a little easier tonight. Potash Corp, helping nature provide So thank you very much, Randy, and thanks to Potash Corp for uh, uh, the, uh, the opening remarks. Um, I said we're very proud to have this conference here in Saskatchewan and in Saskatoon. There's nobody more proud of this than uh, his worship, our mayor, uh, Don Aitchinson, and uh, I'd like him to come along and say a few words uh, to, uh, to welcome everybody here to this lovely city. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is great to be with you. I noticed, first of all, it said a few words. Uh, so we'll try to be as brief as possible. It's great to be with you, though, to be able to, in fact, be on Treaty 6 territory, along with the homeland of the Métis. I have a quick story I want to tell you, and it's a story, and it'll all tie together. I went to the store one day to purchase something, and when I was in the store, pulled out my wallet to pay, and in my wallet, I only had half a $20 bill. Well, this half a $20 bill isn't worth $10. It's worth absolutely nothing because I don't have the other side with the serial numbers on it. 
Went home to find the other half, couldn't find it. Year one went by, two, three. Said to my wife, Mardell, if I throw this half out, Murphy's Law is, the other half will appear tomorrow. So I better keep it. I better keep on hoping that something good will happen. Year four went by, year five this year, Christmas time. I got an anonymous Christmas card and the other half was the $20 bill. I now have $20. Before I had nothing. And it's like so many things in life that if we don't work together and focus in the same direction, we have absolutely nothing. Here in the city of Saskatoon, for example, we had some land that a friend of mine one day phoned me and said, you know, you've got nothing but weeds on it. Uh, what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, next year we'll try and do a better job. He said, why don't you let me grow potatoes on it? And I said, well, if milk grows potatoes on it, that means he won't call me about the weeds and everyone will be really happy. So consequently, we did. Over six years now, we have grown on this particular piece of land, 100,000 pounds of food, and we've been able to send that all to the food bank to those that truly need the food in the end. And the reason I tell you that story too is because of the city of Saskatoon and the volunteers we have that in fact are looking after that land. Saskatoon is known as the volunteer capital of North America. And all you have to do is look at all the different events we put on and people give freely of their time and they ask nothing in return but perhaps maybe a thank you. And while you're in Saskatoon, there are so many other things to do. I'm hoping you're going to get to go to the Light Source Synchrotron. Um, that is an absolutely wonderful project. That's that project there. The city of Saskatoon is the only city in the world that, in fact, granted $2.4 million and asked for nothing in return, other than that it becomes very successful here in our community, and truly it will be over a period of time, and I think that will be wonderful for the food industry as well. You really do play an important part when we hear about the, the growth that's going on here in Saskatoon too. We've had growth over the years and we continue to grow and prosper. Saskatoon over the past 15 years, 90,000 people have moved to Saskatoon. In fact, there have been 50,000 jobs created here in the past 10 years. And the city of Saskatoon opens and is in re receptive to having people move here to be with us from all over. It's just a great place to live. Being the mayor of Saskatoon is really something that is quite very unique and very fortunate that I've been given that opportunity. And while you're here in Saskatoon, we hope that you'll walk just a few feet away from here. Uh, it's actually a couple hundred yards and you'll see a statue of Gabriel Dumont. You'll also see the founders, Chief Whitecap and John Lake, statues of them too. And we believe this is the only place in Canada where you can actually see the statues of uh, an Aboriginal leader, a Canadian leader, a European leader, and a Métis, all within a few feet of each other. There is so much to do in our city, I could be up here forever, but they told me, do you think you could keep it brief? <laughs> but, you know, we want to really encourage you to, to come back to Saskatoon once again to experience us. So once again, on behalf of all the citizens of Saskatoon, to our visitors from around the world, that when you leave Saskatoon, that we hope that you're going to take warm and fond memories of our community with you. We'd ask that you come back sooner rather than later to be with us once again. And the work that you're doing here today is so critical. It's kind of like my $20 bill. Without the research that you're doing, without food security that you're doing, and the population the way it is growing today, we truly need to be able to work together. And by you doing that, we are getting focused and going in that same direction, just as you're doing with this conference right now. And by doing that, we will truly become successful. So once again, thank you ever so much for having me here and congratulations to the volunteers, to the sponsors and because of that, the City of Saskatoon will truly shine and remember the $20 bill. By working together, we'll have so much more. Thanks ever so much and have a great day. Well, thank you, Mayor Atchison, and uh, I'll collect that $20 bill a bit later, I need it. <laughs> so uh, our uh, next speaker to bring greetings from the University of Saskatchewan is uh, our Vice President of Research, uh, Dr. Karen Chad. And uh, I've worked uh, closely with Karen from the day I arrived, and it's been a pleasure every day working with her. And I'm sure she will have a few words of enlightenment about the start of our conference. Karen.
Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is indeed a great pleasure to bring greetings on behalf of the University of Saskatchewan. Welcome to you all from far and wide, and I hope that in your next couple of days, you will take a moment of opportunity to stroll across the river and have an opportunity to visit our beautiful campus. I was absolutely delighted to be able to partake in the next couple of days because this critically important meeting will help set the agenda for tackling the grand challenge in global agriculture today. The conference actually reads like a veritable who's who of top food security experts in various fields from across Saskatchewan, from across Canada, and indeed across the globe. And thank you, I want to congratulate and thank Morse Maloney and our key partners for organizing this stellar line of speakers. And as well to thank my esteemed colleagues and august leaders who I have the privilege to share this podium with. We know, as is mentioned earlier, that food production must double by 2050 to meet the demands of the world's growing population. Whether the daunting challenge of this goal happens to be drought, pests, or plant diseases, we do know this. Research will be a part and must be a part of the solution. At the University of Saskatchewan, we take very seriously our responsibility, actually our moral and social responsibility as a leading Canadian research intensive university to help address these challenges, leveraging our local expertise for global impact. Success in finding solutions involves recognizing three very important key imperatives in today's challenging and changing international research environment. The first, the first is that a challenge like global food security is far too big for any one government, any one industry, or any one university to solve on their own. For this reason, I am delighted that this conference brings together so many different people from across academe, industry, and government. Research partnerships with governments, with companies, and with communities are critical to ensuring that our lab discoveries and new insights are translated into new products and new policies and that these meet our community needs both here and across the globe. Secondly, research teams that tackle complex, multi-dimensional problems like global food security must indeed be multidisciplinary spanning the spectrum from the social sciences to health and science disciplines to policy research. At the University of Saskatchewan, bioscience-related expertise and research spans seven important and relevant colleges, three graduate schools, and numerous research centers, including the Global Institute for Food Security, the Global Institute for Water Security, the Fedoric Nuclear Innovation Center, and our own Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy. With a field-to-fork approach, our researchers work with communities, producers, and companies, helping to grow the province's egg bioscience research and development investment from both private and public sectors and producer groups. It already exceeds a staggering $241 million. Thirdly, finding solutions requires that the best and the brightest minds are here. Competition for research talent has become highly competitive as more countries are realizing the huge economic and social benefits of research. At the University of Saskatchewan, with our audacious egg bioscience research goals, we are attracting top faculty, top graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, many of whom are drawn to our campus by the presence of our world-class imaging facilities, such as the Canadian Light Source Synchrotron and the Saskatchewan Centre for Cyclotron Sciences. 
a feather in our provincial cap, um, is most recently being awarded only one of five Canada First Research Excellence Fund grants, a new federal program that positions universities to excel in economically important areas. Our just over $37 million grant is titled Designing Crops for Global Food Security, and we are using it to create a most unique plant phenotyping and imaging research center. This center, we are privileged and pleased to have led by Dr. Morris Maloney. It will build on our collective research strengths to undertake transformative research while training more than 100 graduate students and postdoctoral fellows. With our, pro uh, with our prominence in agricultural research, training and innovation, we are uniquely positioned to enable Saskatchewan to be a global leader in ag bioscience by 2020, supplying new crop varieties to a hungry world. But as I mentioned before, we cannot and will not do this on our own. We have proven, however, that we can make a difference in this province. I thought you might be interested in just three quick examples. First, our Crop Development Centre has developed 400 commercialized crop varieties, enabling our agricultural industry to better compete in a broad world grains market. Second, University of Saskatchewan research has been the main driver of Saskatchewan's now billion dollar pulse crop industry. If we think back, it was only 20 years ago pulse crops such as lentils and peas were a minor part of the province's agricultural production. Today, Saskatchewan contributes 58% of the world's lentil exports and contributes 55% of the world's pea exports. Third, University of Saskatchewan crop research has increased the productivity from Saskatchewan agricultural lands. Back in 1970, the majority of Saskatchewan's productive land was under summer fallow, generating no income at all for producers. Since then, crop diversification from University of Saskatchewan developed varieties as well as development of seeding equipment and technologies for precise seed and fertilizer placement have significantly reduced Saskatchewan's acreage under summer fallow, increasing, increasing the seeding acreage by 40%. The results are threefold. More land being used to produce food, higher returns for farmers, and more crop choices for producers than ever before. Estimates are that this decrease in fallow land alone has had an impact on the Saskatchewan economy of $50 billion since 1970. This last example really underscores the real value of research and innovation. Our future economic success as a province, as a country, and indeed the world will depend increasingly on such new knowledge and innovation. You, every single one of you in this room, are doing exciting and imaginative work at the forefront of your fields. I wish you, each and every one of you, and you collectively the very best as you together work towards global food security. Thank you very much. Now you've probably figured out by now that this province is a very agriculturally friendly province and many of my colleagues, international colleagues around the world will say uh, it's sometimes difficult to get their governments to really focus on funding agricultural research and I've got to say in this province agricultural research takes a very high profile. And that is in great part because of the influence of our next and final uh, introductory speaker here, Alana Cook. And Alana is the Deputy Minister of Agriculture, although she's destined in a few weeks also to become the Deputy Minister to the Premier of the province. And uh, Alana 
Uh, he's just going to bring greetings from the province and tell you a little bit about the province's commitment to agriculture and food security. Thanks very much, Morris, and good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see such a full room. And uh, on behalf of uh, Premier Bradwall, Agriculture Minister Lyle Stewart, as well as uh, the Government of Saskatchewan, just a big, warm Saskatchewan welcome to all of you. Uh, and thank you so much for making this conference a priority. I'm very excited to be here and be part of uh, the conversation, and I'm confident that the conversations that happen over the next couple of days will help to develop a stronger and more collaborative approach to addressing the food security challenges that we face. While some of you are part of our dynamic uh, bioscience cluster right here in Saskatoon, I know that many of you have traveled a great distance to be here with us. As you likely saw when your plane arrived, our province has a lot of farmland. We have 40% of, of Canada's available farmland right here in Saskatchewan. Now that is only one reason why Saskatchewan is viewed as an agriculture leader. We're also home to some of the most productive, efficient, and innovative farmers in the world. Year after year, our farmers and ranchers produce high quality crops and livestock. We're Canada's leader in many commodities like pulses, canola, and durum, and we're also the top agri-food exporting province in Canada. Now, Randy mentioned potash, and I mean, there's, there's a close link to agriculture there. So, as you can see, we help to feed a growing world population by exporting high-quality goods to over 145 countries around the world. We've been able to accomplish this because of the network of professionals working to advance knowledge and technology in areas such as crop genetics, including agriculture biotechnology. And most of that bioscience and research cluster is here in Saskatoon. Our research and agriculture bioscience community has developed various global innovations that enhance operations and help the environment. Now, just a few decades ago, Saskatchewan was the birthplace for so many advancements in zero tillage, including equipment and crop innovation. And we continue to lead the world today in continued innovations in crop rotation. Karen spoke about uh, the change from summer follow and how much more land is now in active and healthy production. Now, zero tillage is an example of something that has improved soil quality and the sequestering of carbon. Zero till is now a well-accepted production practice in various parts of the world, including places like Australia. Saskatchewan also has a long history of adopting new crops, such as canola and pulses. In fact, canola was developed right here in Western Canada, and over the last 40 years has become one of our most important crops. And to think, in the 1980s, pulse crops didn't even exist here in Saskatchewan. Karen talked about this change and this increased production of, of pulse crops. So it was when the need to increase the supply of pulses to meet the global demand arose, that's when we accepted the challenge. And we're now the largest producer of pulses in Canada and the world's largest pulse exporter. Pulse crops are not only good for consumers' health, they're good for the environment as well. Pulses are an affordable and versatile staple food for many people in the world. And these success stories are a result of Saskatchewan's advantages. We have the natural resources such as land and water to provide the ideal growing conditions. We have a strong agriculture research and bioscience community. We have innovative farmers who are quick and eager to adopt new technology. And we have a government that is very supportive and embraces all that it's going to take to have the tools and technology available to us to feed the world's growing population. Because of this ideal combination, our province is in an ideal position to develop Saskatchewan-led solutions to feed the world. Investing in research and Saskatchewan-led solutions has remained a government priority. This is why the Global Institute for Food Security was created. The organization will continue to build on Saskatchewan's success and develop ways to share our innovation and knowledge on a global scale. That is why it's so appropriate that this conference is here in Saskatoon, here in Saskatchewan. Our government recognizes that we need science-based regulations to make sure that our farmers and ranchers have access to the tools and technologies they need to grow food. All of us will be at an incredible disadvantage if we don't have the ability to use modern science in food production. That is why in Saskatchewan, working hard to gain public trust for modern food production. Consumers have a lot of information 
and misinformation to navigate through. We, as an industry, need to speak up about what we do and why we do it that way. It's part of gaining and keeping what we call our social license. And I encourage all of us in our roles to be a part of that conversation. Not having a social license will affect growth and innovation. It will result in practices that are not sustainable, and this will hurt our economy. But most importantly, it will limit the production of food needed to feed the growing world. Research has shown that shared values are three to five times more important than fact when consumers are forming their opinions. Now obviously, accurate science-based facts are vital, but we need to find the balance of leveraging those facts by more effectively communicating how this relates to the shared values of our industry as well as the consuming public. We clearly all have shared values here today, and I think that's very powerful. I encourage you to share these values as you talk to a wider audience about what we hope to accomplish and how we're going to get there. Again, thank you very much for attending this conference and having this global discussion. I know for Saskatchewan, our journey in helping to achieve global food security is only beginning. We're proud to be a leader in the development of technology that changes the way food is produced, but we're even more proud to be a national leader in advancing agriculture's social license and a part of the discussion on how we bring this technology to the global community. I look forward to seeing what is accomplished here at this conference this week as well as in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alana. And again, a, uh, um, a, an important tip of the hat to this province because it is sincerely one of the great provinces across Canada that is supporting agricultural research as, uh, as one of its uh, core themes. So now we move into uh, the, the, uh, the real meat of our conference. And uh, um, we're going to start out with uh, sessions um, that are going to be managed by my colleague here, uh, Anne Roulin. Now, Anne is the Vice President of Sustainability of Nestle uh, in uh, Veve in Switzerland. Uh, I've known her for many, many years. She is a very accomplished chemist and polymer chemist, an entrepreneur, a 